Hi, my name is Danielle Barreca with the Napa County Historical Society Board of Directors. Thank you for tuning in today. It is because of the support of members like you that we are able to still provide content during this challenging time. Please consider renewing your membership or gifting a membership to a friend or family member. Thank you, and we hope you tune in again. Okay, well, once again, welcome on behalf of the Napa County Historical Society staff, board of directors, um, our members, our volunteers, and our sponsors. I wanna thank our sponsors, the Doctors' Company, a Congregation of Beth Shalom, Aegis, Napa, and Arcadia Press. But now, I really am so honored um, to have the pleasure to introduce our author this evening. And as you know, that's Judge Raymond Guadani. A little bit about him. Um, Judge Guadani, who goes by Ray, was raised in Napa, in what was known as Napa's Little Italy on 4th Street. Napa was about a quarter of this population that it is, a, that it is today, and certainly a very different town, with most people working in most people in Napa working at Napa Pike, Kaiser Steel, the Napa State Hospital, and Mare Island. Childhood days for Ray included the Twilight League baseball team and playing the accordion. In August of 1974, he married Anne. They raised two daughters, who some of you might know, Julia De Natal and Angel Corion, who also live in Napa, work here and raising uh, Ray and Anne's five grandchildren. Judge Guadani started his education at Alta Heights Elementary School, then Silverado Middle School, Napa High, which was the only high school at the time, then Napa Junior College, and then went on to UC Berkeley, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Business in 1968. And then he earned his Juris Doctorate um, at Hastings College of Law in San Francisco in 1971. His professional career awards and acknowledgements are impressive. In 1972 to 1975 at the San Joaquin County Public Defender's Office in Stockton, California, he was deputy public defender. He handled misdemeanors and became chief of the misdemeanor division. From 75 to 95, he opened his own practice with partners, law office of Guadini, Flax and McGrath here in Napa. In 1978, his firm was awarded the first public defender contract in Napa County history. He also maintained a general civil practice of family law, estate planning, civil litigation. From 1995 to 2001, he served as a Napa County Superior Court Commissioner, appointed by the judges to be the first Superior Court Commissioner in Napa County history. He established a first civil collection program to collect fines, fees, and penalties from the convicted criminal defendants. He presided over juvenile delinquency and juvenile dependency court and the child support calendar. He received acknowledgments in 1995 from the Napa County Legal Secretaries Association who selected him as attorney of the year. And in 2000, he was honored by the California Judges Association as California Judge of the Year. In 2001 to 2012, he served as Napa County Superior Court Judge he presided over criminal and civil trials and served as a presiding judge of the court from 2008 to 2010. He was selected in 2011 by Congressman Mike Thompson as an angel in adoption for the, Con the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute. In 2016, he published his first book, Adventures of the Squeeze Box Kid, a memoir of growing up in Napa in the 50s and early 60s. In 2018, he published his second book, Tuna, the Wonder Dog, who he thinks, which he thinks is his best, his best book. Well, maybe. Um, and now what brings us together is his third book about to be released on January 18th, The Napa Murder of Anita Fajani Andrews, A Cold Case That Caught a Serial Killer, published by the History Press Arcadia. Please give a warm welcome to judge and author Ray Guadani. Thank you, Liz. Uh, that's probably the best introduction I've ever received and ever will receive. So thank you very much. I do want to thank the Napa Historical Society <clears throat> for allowing me to make this presentation tonight. And I'd like to start just with a brief uh, statement about what the book is about. 
It's a true crime story of a Napa citizen, Anita Fajani um, Andrews. And Anita was struck by uh, a tragic event on July 10th, 1974. And her life was lost unjustly, incomprehensibly, and unexpectedly. And that in the most basic terms is what the story is about. I wrote the book, I, I, I think for a number of reasons, um, I, I felt I had a unique perspective uh, of, of the story. Um, I was the trial judge, so I presided over the trial and got to hear uh, all the evidence uh, and rule on all the evidence uh, that was presented uh, and including the defense, uh, the defense's position. Uh, also, I'm a native Napan, and so I remember the case when it happened. I was moving back to Napa and my uh, af after the crime, which was a horrific crime, my brother and I'd be downtown and we'd peer through the window because after the murder, uh, the deceased a sister closed the bar that very next day forever. And so, uh, and she, but yet she, pres she preserved the services, the pg and &E, and it stayed that way for 37 years while other uh, development went up, went around. So it was like uh, frozen in time. And my brother and I would peer through the window and you could see the actual uh, scene, uh, which was the true crime scene, not a, not a reproduction of the crime scene, but the crime scene. And it was kind of eerie. Um, having um, grown up here, um, I knew it was an unusual and horrific murder by Napa standards. Napa was a very tranquil place. It was, um, the police described it to me as a uh, beer drinking, whiskey drinking town. It was, most of the offenses were DUIs or uh, drunken public types of offenses. N not, not these kinds of uh, murders. Um, the other thing is I wasn't a disinterested observer uh, of this situation. I knew um, as a young boy uh, and then later as a teenager and then later as a young lawyer, I, I knew a lot of the police officers involved. Um, there was, uh, as a young teen, I remember Dewey Burnsett. He had two daughters that um, my classmates and I went to school with, Barbara Burnsett and her older sister, Pat. I knew uh, the police chief at the time, Ken Jennings, uh, Don Kemper, uh, Chuck Hansen. Hansen was kind of an untrained, um, formally untrained forensic uh, police officer. There was Frank Madalena. Frank was an old Napin, and he, he was my Santa Claus. He would come over to our house, and my brother and I didn't know who it was Frank, but we'd sit on his lap. And so I knew these police officers, Ron Montgomery, Joe Moore, Peter Jarich. Uh, the evidence technician was Janet Lipsy, a wonderful person. And then I knew Jim Boitano, the district attorney. I knew him as a kid. He had me play as a, my accordion at his native son's Christmas party. But I also knew him as a young lawyer. We, we did battle a couple of times on a couple of murder cases. So I knew these players. And, um, uh, and finally, I also knew the new officers. When I became a judge, I knew the ones that took over the investigation, uh, Detective Weiniger was the chief detective uh, who took it over in 2006. And Sergeant Shulman, who's also, um, uh, uh, I think now retired uh, from Napa. So anyway, I had a unique connection to the town and the players. And that's, um, that's how I came about to writing the book and how I came about believing I had a unique uh, perspective on it. Yes. Um, that's the title of the book, and um, what, what uh, that's the cover of the book, and the top right there you can see Anita. Uh, Anita was a long uh, time napping, and um, she was uh, an 18-year-old beauty queen. She was Miss Napa County. At the time of her murder, she was uh, 51 years old, uh, divorced, had two daughters, and um, that was on July 10th, 1974. She came from an Italian family. We did grow up in, um, in uh, Little Italy. Anita um, had a father, Nicola Fajani, who started the bar in 1945. And then her uncle, Andrew Fajani, 
was a Napa County supervisor. Uh, they were a well-known um, Napa family. Her sister was Muriel Fajani, who was a school teacher and later um, a person who kept the government on their toes. She, it was not unusual to see her at a school board meeting or a board of supervisors or city council meeting asking intelligent questions. She wasn't always popular because she could drag out a meeting uh, having you answer these questions, but they were good questions. And she was a devoted, a devoted sister to her, uh, to Anita. And that's part of the reason this, the book is so unique because uh, when her sister was uh, murdered and she's the one that found the body because she got a call from her mom who said, I can't get a hold of Anita and she's not at work. Uh, Anita worked at the state hospital as a secretary during the day. discovered her, her body and would not leave the sight of her sister. The officers couldn't persuade her to do so. She was very calm, although that, to me, it sounded like she was in shock. But they finally were able to escort her to a police vehicle and, and get her in there. But she shut the bar down right then and there and always preserved it, hoping if the police needed to see anything, they had that crime scene there. And she nudged them, sometimes not so gently, to keep uh, pressing on their investigation. Uh, the, the bar itself um, was located um, at 813 Main Street in downtown Napa. It's, um, oh, uh, let me back up. That's uh, the picture of the Fajani uh, girls. Uh, Nita's on the left, Muriel's on the right, and Nicola, the father, is in the middle. And that's a scene after a mass at St. John's wedding. And also there's the insert of of Anita's uh, obituary. Uh, the next slide should show, uh, yes, Fajani's. You can see Fajani's, um, and it's a photo at Main and Third Street in the 70s. And the next photo should be a photo straight on of the bar. Yeah, there's Fajani's uh, with the old sign, with the cocktail sign. And um, as you can see, it, uh, um, if, if I could see the next photo, uh, excuse me, next slide. Yeah, there's the bar inside. It was uh, on your left as you entered. And you, if it's hard to see here, but the at the time of the murder, Anita was closing up apparently and was cleaning the bar. Except, and so all the stools are in there except one stool is kind of kicked out. And that's where on top of the counter, they found a cigarette. And uh, that's where everybody believes the suspect was who ended up uh, murdering her. This next scene shows the pool table and the uh, jukebox and uh, the taxidermy uh, heads of the uh, deer overlooking this bar. Um, and that's again, as it was taken on the day after the murder. Um, the murder occurred um, and there's the front entrance of the bar. I think you can see the stool better there that was pushed out. Um, the circumstances um, are, are, are this. N Nicola died, Nic the father, in 1969. And the bar had a very unusual liquor license. Uh, it had an on-sale, off-sale license, which was very valuable because ABC didn't issue them anymore. So when he died, the girls took over, but both had jobs. Muriel was a teacher and, and, and Anita worked as a secretary at the state hospital. But they had to keep, if, that, if they didn't keep the bar open for six months, they'd lose the license. So they, their intent was to keep it open for as long as it took to probably sell the bar. And so the girls would bartend at night and Muriel was not a people person and Anita was. So Anita did most of the actual bartending and Muriel would do the bookkeeping. And that's why we have a woman alone in this bar night after night. Um, the police, this is small town police, they had their uh, habits and customs and they knew how to patrol uh, downtown. And they, um, they uh, would drive by and if they saw the padlock on the door and Anita's Cadillac gone and the light out, they knew it was closed because Anita didn't keep regular hours. She'd go uh, five to nine, five to 10, depending on business and how she felt. But if, they, if the door was uh, uh, not 
paddle act and uh, pat paddle locked and the car was there and the light on they knew it was still open on the night of the murder they the police strayed from that little routine because uh, they had a they had a spotlight they could spot it on the door uh, they must not have done it because they would have seen the padlock wasn't on and yet the car was gone um, that's significant because had they had they spotted it then and checked it out they may have caught the man and 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 if they didn't they would have at least discovered the body and had hours of a head start in catching this murderer and that's significant because within 50 days he'd murdered again up in Colorado so uh, any head start would have been uh, helpful but it didn't happen and so um uh, i i i think now i want to get to the circumstances of the uh, murder and so thank you for putting that slide up that's the uh, actual uh, a copy of the napa register uh, it says woman found dead in family's downtown bar and it occurred on July 10th, 1974. And that picture there is hard to see here, but it's Muriel and the district attorney, Jim Boitano. I wanted to read a passage from the book at this point. There were three men uh, who were in that bar who saw this stranger, and this is how it happened. Uh, the, the number one topic of discussion around town of Napa during the week of July 10th, 1974, was what Mayor Ralph Bolin called, quote, an un unseasonable rainstorm. Although the rain uh, eased the fire danger from the intense heat, um, <clears throat> when the storm hit, it played havoc on the city police department since its new building, then under construction, had no roof. So no one expected rain in the Napa Valley during July. July evenings in Napa are usually warm and that Wednesday uh, evening was no exception. The temperature hovered uh, in the high 70s and at Kiwanis Park, several blocks south of downtown, teams of teenage girls were playing fast pitch softball Across the river to the east, high school boys played baseball under the lights at the fairgrounds. <clears throat> and the Uptown Theater was showing The Great Gatsby starring Robert Redford and Mia Farrell. None of that mattered to Al Mufage, Al McKenzie or David Luce as they strolled down Third Street to the Happy Hours Bar. And the Happy Hours Bar um, was on 1543 Third uh, Street and it was a beer joint. Today, that building is still there, a very small building. It's now uh, Edward Jones Financial uh, Consultant. It's financial services, but that base light brick uh, bar is, or the building is still there. Um, okay, so uh, they went to the happy hours and one of their favorite ha hangouts uh, was the happy hours to grab a beer and talk. Next, they intended to visit Catania's Pizza Parlor on Silverado Trail, where Al McKenzie uh, was playing steel guitar in the band. McKenzie was personable, he was smart, and he was fun to be around, a happy, playful man who liked to enjoy himself. Luce played, enjoyed his friends, and he liked sharing beers with him. Mufage, as later described by David Luce, was a, quote, a bit odd. He was older than we were, had a full beard with shoulder length white hair and was eccentric. Sometimes his behavior could be pretty strange. He could be loud, he could be boisterous, belligerent and abusive. Al was a native Napan and so he knew everybody and everything about everybody. After a few rounds of beer, the three men left the happy hours and they made their way down to third to Main Street. They still had some time before McKenzie's musical performance at Catania and as they neared the corner, they decided to add a stop at Fajani's Cocktail Lounge. When one entered Fajani's through the front door, the, the wooden bar ran along the left wall with stools all the way toward the back of the room. I don't know if you can get that slide up again to show it. A pool table sat in the middle of the room and along the opposite wall were a few tables with chairs and a jukebox. Three taxidermy deerheads looked down on the scene. 
at the end of the bar was a small storage room for, uh, that was kept for supplies. A staircase led to the offices upstairs and even in 1974, the bar looked like something out of an earlier era. The beautiful old fashioned countertop had a backdrop of mirrors and a colorful array of liquor bottles. The basic uh, com commercial pool table with its green felt top appeared to have been heavily used over the years. The bar stools were old, but in fair condition, and the tables across from the bar showed their wear. The three friends arrived at Fajani's around 9 p.m., settling on the three stools closest to the bar. Al Mufage sat next to the entrance, and David Luce sat in the middle with Al McKenzie on Luce's right. Sitting close to the front door was intentional. When I go into a bar, Luce explained, I uh, survey the entire inside just to see who's there and where they are because things happen in bars. Fracases occur and you have to know where all the players are. As the three friends settled in, they noticed a man sitting on a bar stool toward the back of the room. That's where I'll stop, but that sets the scene. And they were, um, they were uh, alone. That's, there were only four people in the bar uh, and the bartender. And so, um, the um, uh, investigation, uh, so, so the bodies discovered the next day and uh, uh, Muriel calls uh, the police and they come down and um, Jim Boitano, the DA himself is called and he goes down, there's a picture of Jim. And uh, they, the, Boitano was considered a very frugal man uh, some people say he, he had his, he, he still had his first nickel, but he spared no expense here. He, he called, they didn't have a, a criminalist, a forensic criminalist who uh, could reconstruct crime scenes. He called a man in Berkeley that he knew who was a criminalist, a young scientist, 27 years old, um, Peter Barnett. Barnett drove right up to Napa and did a crime scene reconstruction, took evidence, and he and the police that uh, Boitano had in there preserved everything. And it was very impressive because this is before DNA was commonplace. Uh, this was, I mean, people didn't even know about DNA uh, uh, at this level. So, but yet they preserved everything. They preserved the cigarette uh, that you were never gonna get fingerprints off that, this little cigarette, but they got DNA off it years and years later. So preserving anything was, uh, everything was very good work by the, in terms of the um, uh, police. And there is a slide of the cigarette, I think. Yeah, there, there's that slide. Um, now, um, there have been scientific um, advances. You can see here, uh, that's the screwdriver they found, which was the presumed murder weapon. And if you see the number seven there on the sink behind the bar is the screwdriver. Um, because one of the issues at trial was they might have been able to put the, the charged defendant at the scene at the bar, but nothing put him behind the bar or in the storage room. Later, I can explain that the evidence gets developed. But uh, that shows you where the... Uh, Screwdriver was, and by the way, it was completely cleaned and was totally washed. Um, there, there, you know, after um, years and years, uh, it became a cold case. There were no more leads. And so it wasn't actively being pursued. And so uh, as decades went by, some of the officers retired, some of them died. And although some very dedicated people uh, could never get that out of their system. I, I know um, um, Robert Jarecki was one of them. He rose to the position of captain. Uh, it, it bothered him uh, till he was uh, till he died. Um, but uh, he continued to worry to worry and pursue it. So did Pete uh, Jarich. Um, Jarich. Some of these police had to get creative. Uh, Pete Jarich took a sample of the towel and drove it to a conference on DNA in 2000. It was still too early, but he drove it there and people were starting to talk about it. 
trying to get it tested for free because testing DNA uh, evidence pieces then was extraordinarily expensive in 2000. It's since come, came way down. And when Detective Weiner got to it in 2006, it was a lot more reasonable. Anyway, my only point there is these police officers were completely dedicated. Um, all right, so Napa had no cold case unit, meaning they didn't have a police uh, detail to, uh, to, to analyze this. L let me stop to look at the Connor Hotel. When the police investigated this crime, they looked at the Napa State Hospital um, because uh, uh, Anita worked as a secretary there and they had some dangerous, mentally ill people. And um, uh, the Connor Hotel uh, was at one time a, a, a fine hotel, I guess. Uh, they had the Terry's Waffle Shop uh, a restaurant there and um, it, it was maybe not the Plaza Hotel, but it was the next best. But over the years, it deteriorated. And then when um, Ronald Reagan as governor uh, let a lot of the mentally ill patients out on the streets, and when Vietnam was going on with people coming back with PTSD, that's where they were being housed with assistance. And so there were some troubled people there with, and some were violent. Uh, the, the Connor Hotel is uh, right there at 3rd in Maine across from Fajani's and is now Veterans Park. So it was uh, taken down. But that was uh, fraught with uh, people in there that were logical suspects. So the police pursued that. They looked at everyone that registered there and everyone that registered um, next to the day of the murder and who left after the murder. They looked at everything. Uh, again, nothing, nothing came up. And the same with the state hospital. Now, um, now moving over, um, Anita's Cadillac was missing. Um, that's the Cadillac, the 1967 Cadillac. It's a replica. That, of course, isn't the car. They never found the car. But the Cadillac... Uh, turned up missing, and they couldn't find it. And that uh, has troubled a lot of the officers even to this day. How do you get rid of the Cadillac? After 37 years, if it was put in a lake or in a river, you think it would have uh, from it would have emerged somehow. If it was parsed, uh, parceled out um, uh, and junked, uh, they have to do the paperwork. Um, so. Um, my dad ran a, a wrecking yard, Al's Auto Wreckers, uh, on McKinn Street. So it, to do it legally, you would have had to do it that way. If, if, if Melanson had it done illegally, then to me, that means he may have had a, 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 an, an accessory uh, aiding him and abetting him in the crime. Any, in any event, uh, that Cadillac never turned up uh, after the, uh, the murder, except at a gas station in Sacramento and... Uh, Beyond that, it was it, it disappeared. Um, in 2006, with no cold case unit, uh, in 2006, Detective Don Weiniger, and, and now he's the new guard of the police at, at that time, was assigned to the case. And um, even though there was no um, cold case unit, uh, he was assigned to the case, but he had to maintain his... Um, his uh, current caseload. So it was tough on him. He had to work on it when he can't could, but, but uh, otherwise do his caseload that was current. And that's a lot of pressure on the police because people want their current crime solved. Uh, if you've been ripped off or robbed or a burglary, um, this was not current, even though they wanted to get to the bottom of it. But Weiniger did the best he could, and, and, and the best was the best. He was really doggedly pursued it and organized it. And um, finally, uh, he um, sent things into CODIS, uh, to the Department of Justice, who used CODIS, which is the combined um, DNA indexing system. It's a blend of forensic science and computer technology. And it enables uh, the police to electronically send in DNA to this national indexing system. And you can find possibly, you, 
it, it helps you solve crimes, find missing persons and suspects and people in jail. And um, that's exactly what happened here. There was a D DNA hit. And I wanted to, uh, So this is what, uh, this is from the book again. Weiniger's first move was to look into the circumstances of the conviction that had led to Roy Melanson being housed at Fort Lyon Correctional Facility in Colorado, because the match led him to, they found this man, Roy Melanson, and he was in, he was in a Colorado State Prison for a conviction. He discovered on October 1st, 1993, Melanson had been convicted of the first degree murder of Michelle Wallace in Gunnison County, Colorado, which had occurred sometime between August 29th and September 1st, 1974. He was serving a life sentence. So even though he did this murder, Melanson, in 74, 50 days after Anita's, he, they, they didn't get him until 93 and they convicted him and that's what he was doing a life sentence on. This fact hit Weiniger right between the eyes. The murder of Anita Andrews occurred sometime between 10 p.m. on July 10th, 1974 and 9 a.m. on July 11th, 1974. Approximately 50 days later, Melanson had murdered Michelle Wallace in Colorado. That was shocking in and of itself. If Melanson had murdered Anita Andrews, then he was a serial killer. And that's when Melanson realized who he was, who he was dealing with. Uh, excuse me, I meant Weiniger realized who he was dealing with. So uh, Detective Weiniger then uh, took this evidence to Gary Lieberstein, the district attorney at the time, and um, wrote a search warrant. And uh, excuse me, um, uh, Lieberstein assigned uh, Paul Giroux to the case. And Paul Giroux uh, obviously took Weiniger as his trial, uh, his trial uh, expert de detective. And then he also, the female in the middle is uh, Leslie Severe. It's now Leslie Pate. She got married and she was a, a, an investigator. She's now a chief investigator, but at the time, uh, a regular investigator. And he selected her. And you can see why later, uh, both Weiniger and uh, Pate are outstanding at their job. And Giroux is uh, an outstanding trial attorney. So that is the trial team that prosecuted this case. Um, all right, the um, suspect was finally uh, brought to car court and charged, and he was appointed to the public defender. And the public defender um, assigned to him was Allison Walensky. Allison Walensky was a veteran. She had uh, at least 60 jury trials and been uh, a public defender in Los Angeles where they have heavy caseloads and then came to Napa and became a public defender. So she knew her way around the court and she was a formidable opponent uh, for the trial team. Um, she also had an investigator to assist her and she had uh, the ability to get expert uh, forensic people also to confront the evidence that Giroux had from his uh, forensic scientists. So um, there is a mugshot back to 1975 of Roy Melanson. Looked a lot different at the trial 37 years later. Uh, he had gained weight, he was in a wheelchair, but at that time, that's what he looked like. And that's who eventually um, David Luce was able to ID from a photo lineup. Um, and there's David Luce, uh, and there's the photo lineup in which he was able to pick him out. You can see in the photo lineup um, that was uh, Melanson on the uh, number six photo, and that's who um, Luce, after all those years, picked out. And, and it was not unequivocal. I think he said, if I had to pick someone, it, uh, it's, it's that man there. Um, and so he was able to do it. There was an odd thing in the trial. 
Luce was terminally ill and in a wheelchair. He was dying. Um, he had a wonderful sense of humor and a wonderful attitude toward life, and he seemed devoted to this case. It was as if he was going to get this testimony out before he died, but he didn't, he didn't fail to remind the court that um, he, he said, you know, I'm, I'm beyond my expiration date. Uh, let's get going. You know, he wanted to move this case along. But one thing that was odd is he was in a wheelchair and the defendant was in a wheelchair and it was kind of weird to see two people, two foes who had met 37 years before in this bar in facing each other in, in wheelchairs. Um, now, uh, and there's the suspect, uh, Roy Melanson, it, later the defendant and later convicted. Um, as you can see, he's much different there. Um, still doesn't look like a neat guy, but he, he's um, much heavier. And um, uh, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, some of the police thought he was just, uh, faking it being in a wheelchair did it for sympathy i have no idea if that's true or not but um that's what was said uh, years later when i was researching the book uh including a couple of uh correctional officers um said he could pop up at a moment's notice and and the hair on your neck would still raise uh raise up and this was from correctional officers anyway that's what he looked like in court and um the case against him was not all that strong because as I said, and I'm sorry for repeating myself, he, the DNA could put him, put him in the bar smoking the cigarette, but it couldn't put him in the storage room and it couldn't put him behind the bar. Um, later, there was some weaker DNA evidence of a towel behind the bar and, um, and, and the, uh, it kind of indicated uh, that there was some DNA from Melanson. So that put, putting him behind the bar was pretty critical. Uh, and like I said, the, the murder weapon was already cleaned. Um, so anyway, it was a weak case, except that's where the district attorney and the Department of Justice with their forensics were able to come uh, to the uh, rescue. Now, um, there were other things that were admitted into evidence and, and they were some of his prior crimes. Uh, they can be admitted into evidence if it's sex crimes uh, to show his propensity for that. And some other evidence can be admitted to show his um, uh, intent or knowledge or dis common plan and design. For instance, one of his rapes uh, or a couple of them, the, the stocking was off the left leg, but not the right. And that's the way Anita was found. That could come in for his MO, so to speak, his common design and plan. So some of those were let in and some were kept out because they weren't as relevant. That was a, a very difficult uh, hand dealt to the defendant uh, because that let the jury hear about uh, some of his past acts. Uh, and they and they were uh, they were pretty gruesome too. So um, uh, I I do remember one uh, previous rape victim who was still alive came to court and testified. And again, um, if you could see it, um, the way she identified him was uh, I don't think there was a dry eye in the and the eyes of the jury, the way uh, she looked at him and emphatically identified him. She still had anger, you could see. Um, so anyway, um, when all that evidence was in uh, and the defense then you know, presented their case and they had an expert to try to weaken the DNA, Dro did an excellent job and so did uh, Walensky. And then it, after all that was, then it was uh, turned over to the jury for their uh, deliberation. It took uh, almost two days of deliberation, which surprised me really after I heard all the evidence. Um, but um, Walensky did a heck of a good job and, and I think had them thinking about it very much. Um, I, I, um, I have some chapters at the end that trace where um, uh, the people are today. Uh, in terms of victims, it's quite sad because the um, 
um, the, it, crimes like this destroy a lot more than just the victims. It can destroy families. It can destroy in-laws. Uh, there was one prior by Melanson um, in which for years they, they couldn't catch him. And so for years they blamed the fiance and it was a small town. And so he was shunned by the town people. He didn't move. He maintained his innocence, but no one really believed him. And it destroyed two families, the, the vi victim's family and the uh, fiance's family, because they were close. They were going to be married it tore him apart. So uh, another uh, victim's mother uh, killed herself two weeks after her daughter went missing and left instructions to the uh, husband to bury her by her daughter if her daughter was ever found. Um, she was found 20 years later and she was buried there. So it's, it, it really destroys people's lives. I know you all know that, but it, it's, it's terrible to see it. And then I traced where the trial team was today and the defense attorney. Uh, Allison Walensky is uh, uh, still at the public defender's office, although I've, I've heard rumors she's retiring and, and still gonna uh, maybe on her own do some defense work. And she's um, a, a, a fine attorney. Uh, Jero uh, has risen to assistant district attorney, assistant to only Allison Haley, the district attorney. He's become prosecutor of the year for his work. Um, Leslie Sevier uh, got married, Leslie Pate. Um, she became the investigator of the year years later. Uh, just excellent team. And uh, Detective Weiniger was to me the, one of the heroes of this uh, case, if not the hero for all the work he did. He's retired and he's in Florida uh, golfing and um, that's where he's at now with his wife. And one of the things I have at the end of the book is a picture, he came back to Napa to pin the sheriff's badge on his son who graduated from the sheriff's department. And it's a picture of his wife and him and his son. It's really touching. So that's where that team is. And Melanson appealed and in a 31 page decision years later, the Court of Appeal affirmed the decision. It's now final and it's pretty clear he's probably going to uh, die uh, in prison now. He was going to be up for parole in 2012, the next year after the trial, but um, the sentence he was given was consecutive to the life sentence in the Colorado trial. So that pretty much ensures that uh, he will die in prison probably with the secrets, uh, some secrets that could lead to other cases that could at least bring resolution, but uh, uh, he hasn't talked yet. I think that's uh, about all I can say for now. Thank you so much, um, Judge Guadani. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating book. It's a hard book. It's, you know, it tells, it tells a lot of truth and um, you know, truth is where healing begins or it can begin. Um, just as our the theme of our current exhibit, who tells our story, it's about the voices heard and unheard. And you're sharing the voice of Anita that was unheard. And along with Officer Weiniger um, and Dave Luce and others um, that were part of this case and brought before the jury. So I want to thank you for your service as one of our honorable judges and over this trial and other difficult trials. Um, I know we've got a couple messages coming in or questions, excuse me, questions coming in. Um, but one thing I, I want to ask, and I, I, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit before, but you learned some things in writing this book that as a presiding judge, you don't know about. Were, can you share just a little bit about that? Maybe a couple things that you learned that might've been helpful to the jury, but just wasn't admissible to the, in the trial for some reason? Yeah, yes. Um, this, and it may sound a little unusual uh, to non-lawyers and non-judges, uh, but I did learn a lot about the behind the scenes work of law enforcement um, and, and even the defense. Um, and I never knew about that at the time of the trial. All the work that went on preparing this case, the investigation, the round-the-clock round work of the uh, police, 
I, I didn't know it. And, and, and I, as I said, it may sound uh, strange to uh, non-lawyers and non-judges, uh, but a, a, a judge by law, um, after a criminal complaint is filed and before a guilty plea or a verdict of guilty is not allowed to read or consider any written report, any oral report by any law enforcement officer uh, or any witness to any offense um, that has, or anybody who has any information reflecting uh, the arrest or conviction record of the defendant. Um, so any representation of any kind, verbal or written, about the defendant uh, is illegal. It's improper uh, for a judge uh, to know about that ahead of the trial. The, the reason is you're trying to keep the judges fair and impartial and not learn things that are not admissible in evidence uh, because it can bias you. It, it's... Um, uh, 1204.5 of the penal code, uh, which says that you can't learn about it. Now, now I have to temper that with, obviously the trial judge starts to learn about the case when he's asked to rule on pre-trial motions. Uh, for instance, the crimes that Giroux and his trial team uncovered about Melanson, uh, I, I learned about that in pre-trial motions by Giroux to have them admitted and in uh, Walensky's pretrial motions to have them excluded from the jury. So I knew all of that, uh, and I, that's proper to know, but you, you can't know beyond something presented to you in the trial or the lead up to the trial, you're not able to, to know. And so I did learn a lot about it when I got the police reports back in 1974 that I never saw or heard of. Um, you, you really start learning things about what happened. Speaking of, there's a moment um, that you talk about where um, Anita's in the bar, and as you mentioned, there's there's three you know patrons in the bar, um, three other patrons or four other patrons, and one person that was a stranger to the locals, to Dave and and his couple friends that were there, and he was kind of um, had his head down and wasn't really showing his face, and he got called out by one of the locals and Dave Luz had an opportunity to see Melanson face to face and up close. Can you share that real quick? Yeah, and, and thanks Liz, because you raise a pretty important crucial part. Uh, the three men uh, saw this man and he, uh, he had his hand over his face talking to Anita uh, and the hand was sheltering him from those three guys. And um, as you remember, I told you one of the guys was a real, uh, quite a character, and he just, uh, he didn't like that. And so he, uh, and he didn't watch his tongue ever. And in fact, he had been thrown out of a few other bars with lifetime banishments. And uh, Luce didn't want that to happen again when he yelled out, hey, you son of a bitch, why are you hiding your face? That's what he said. And, mm -hmm. and um, the, the, the suspect didn't do anything. He just ignored it kept drinking his beer, smoking his cigarette. So Luce, really afraid of getting kicked out and uh, not having another bar they can't go back to, uh, decided to go to the bathroom, which was in the back. And so when he went by, uh, he comes back from the bathroom and stops. And he said, I'm sorry about Al. He's kind of a, a weird guy. And he put out his hand and he spent about 30 seconds there face to face with him. And they shook hands. The guy never said much but they shook hands and um, um, Luce even testified it at the trial. He said it was the wet, slimy, uh, terrible handshake that he remembered once in 1960 when he shook hands with Richard Nixon. So uh, that brought some chuckles in the courtroom when he said that, but he remembered him and he saw him for half a minute. Wow, chilling. Yeah. Yeah, really chilling. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, we're, by, we're at eight o'clock, so we're going to continue for those who want to continue to enjoy this uh, we, this uh, session here um, with uh, Judge Guadani on his book that's about to be released. Um, any idea how many, a couple of people asked uh, ask this. I know there's probably no real way, but you know he's a serial killer, um, maybe through absences of, in time, but you know, per, in terms of uh, when um, he wasn't in, in prison or in jail, that any idea how many people he might have killed over the years? Does anybody have an idea or estimation? 
Yeah, we 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 looked at seven. Um, not all not all were uh, murders. They were all at least rapes. He he evolved as a murderer, and and I don't mean that to be flip. He would rape people, and they would uh, some of them would turn him in, and he'd be convicted. So. Uh, Later, he just started killing him, so they weren't around to turn him in. So he and and so he started becoming a serial murderer. He was clearly a serial rapist, and then a serial murderer. And he was a drifter. Where was where did he come from, and what brought him into Napa? He was from Texas. Uh, we don't know. We don't know uh, why he was in Napa, uh, or why he drifted into town. I, no idea. Uh, Detective Weiniger has always been bothered by the, he, he could patch where Melanson went, except for the last four months of, um, be, before the murder of Anita. It still bugs him to this day, uh, what happened then and how many people he may have hurt or killed. Um, so I, I would say, except for those seven, I have no idea, but he wasn't above uh, doing great bodily injury um, to people. Did he ever go, another question from the audience, did he ever go and get married, have children, have kind of a normal sense of life ever? Yes. Or kind of like blended in? Yeah, no, no, uh, no to a normal life. Yes to um, having a girlfriend who he impregnated and left, right away left. So he may have a, a living son out there, um, treated her poorly, but nowhere near like he treated women after that he just left her left her yeah it's probably for the best for her right um yeah, and he, he was locked up a lot too um someone asked if they want to know if you're familiar with joe page who they believe worked in the coroner's office at that time was the coroner's mm -hmm. office involved or joe page do you recall him no i i, I don't recall him there, the coroner's office was involved. There was a medical examiner who died by the time we got to trial. Um, but yeah, we had, the police had the autopsy. But no, I, I don't recall him. Um, and I know I, you and I talked about this a little bit, but he's, he's still alive. I think you mentioned that earlier today too. Have you had an opportunity to interview him? No, I, some of, some of my friends and family wanted me to, to, try, to try that, to go to uh, Colorado where he's still housed uh, to interview him. And I, I thought about it. I didn't, I, I wasn't looking forward to doing something like that. I was hoping his defense attorney might, uh, might consider it uh, just in case uh, he wanted to unburden himself and um, tell us about things that, that still linger here. What are there a couple details about this case that if you could interview him, what would might be some of the questions that you would want to have a better understanding on this case? Oh um, yeah, I, I, I would like pr pretty much it's what um, it's what um, Detective Weiniger uh, wanted to know. Uh, where is that 1967 Cadillac? What what happened to it? How did it disappear completely? Did he have help? Uh, was he aided and abetted? Um, and if he ditched it, why why hasn't it uh, emerged? Uh, there was that f missing four months that Weiniger really bothered him, and, and 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 along those lines, like we talked, how and why did he come to Napa? Um, when they when Weiniger went to Fort Lyon in two thousand and seven or eight to interview him. Uh, Weiniger said uh, that Melanson said he'd never been to Napa, never been to California, except passing through needles, uh, which, of course, that that impeached his credibility right away when they got the DNA of that cigarette in Napa. Yeah, that lie kind of that was uh, that was a pretty big piece of evidence when he lied. The do you recall the makeup of the jury? You and know, was it very, no, not really. Okay. Um, and then we've got some questions regarding, you know, following the murder and the family. I remember Muriel, um, as you described her, and, uh, you know, attending council meetings and asking really strong questions and, you know, um, 
and she and she you know my understanding is that she, she and her mother decided you know right after the murder they're gonna they closed um Bajiani's, you know bar and lounge and as you said kept it as a crime scene they didn't touch anything they just it was frozen in time it was like a time capsule if you will yeah. and some folks are wondering why they did that um and um did muriel ever see that the murder was finally you know found he was finally tried and, and sent to prison yeah um <clears throat> uh, the the why she closed the bar the police uh some of the policemen i talked to said that um she was not going to open it until they found um, the murderer. Uh, she wanted to preserve the crime scene so the police could go in there at any time, day or night, whenever they wanted. She paid for a PG&E. Uh, the phone was still on. Some some kids used to go to the phone booth. That's all there was. And of course, the phone booth and call for Johnny's bar and then run down and listen to the phone ringing. I mean, she kept everything there. Uh, some people say there was still change on the bar, but I never I never saw that. Um, Anyway, so she did that supposedly to preserve it for the police. And it was very eerie with the, the jury took a visit of the scene and it was eerie to be in there. And uh, the defense and the prosecutor both said every time they'd been in there investigating the case, it was an eerie feeling. And any, anyway, it's um, it, it was just um, something unusual because Everything around uh, the, that that bar was being uh, modernized and rebuilt, and that's why it felt like freezing, frozen in time. Oh, the other part of the question was, did Muriel uh, know about it? Um, you know, I I happened to be doing probate court when her lawyer came in and said that uh, she was incompetent, uh, and so I had to appoint a guardian or a conservator. Um, but in 2010, when they had a suspect, they finally, you know, they had Melanson. Uh, one of the officers, uh, Detective Weininger or, or Leslie Severe, um, uh, someone went to see her and she still had, you know, incompetency is very transient and she was having a good day, I guess. And they said, we think we have the man, we have a suspect, Muriel. To which Muriel asked the officer, uh, I want to go see him. And he said, well, I don't know, we can arrange that. I want to ask him why. And that's uh, that's what they said. Yeah, I'm sure everybody wants to know why. It's hard to. Yeah, she was so devoted. But but she did know that there, if you will, on the good day that he was caught. That you know, um, and she, and a couple people are asking if she was in Napa during her passing, and she was. And I recall that the case was, um, and this I might be wrong, but my recollection is that it was, he was convicted um, just a couple months after she passed away. I, I thought her obituary came just a couple months before the actual trial ended. Is that right. correct? Yeah, she died before, uh, I I don't know the date. I thought she died before the trial even started, but maybe okay. not, but she died okay. before the verdict. Her, she, I think it's a cousin who's watching tonight, mm -hmm. um, Violet, who says she's had quite a few conversations. Um, and um, I think she said with Nita, so if you ever want to talk to Violet or we can we can connect connect you to if you want to hear more about Nita. Um, it's now 810. I'm going to look for one more question before we close tonight. Um, you know, let's talk about um, what you're going to write next. Are you going to do something fun and like you another memoir? Are you going to do another case? Do you have something else you're thinking of doing as, as your next book? Um, yeah, I. I'm doing um, a collection of true crime stories. Um, each each crim criminal uh, story will be a chapter. So it'll be a collection of, of uh, true crime uh, stories coming out of Napa. Do you know which one, anyone in particular intrigues you the most? I mean, hate to uh, know. Yeah, you know, I, I, one, I've already finished that chapter. It's on Lenvest. And I don't know if you remember the lender. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, it was a pyramid scheme. And in, and while it wasn't, um, I, I, I better not keep going, but I just want to say it wasn't, 
a crime of physical violence, but it was, uh, it hurt a lot of people financially. It yeah. devastated this community and, uh, and, and, and it, and it hurt people emotionally and psychologically. So it did its, it, it had tremendous consequences in this town. Absolutely. I remember that. I remember that. Well, thank you, yeah. Ray, My Judge pleasure. Badani. This is a fascinating evening. You did a Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the programming. Remember, you can social distance while still getting closer to local history.